Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. He's walking down the, down the thing there. Satan said, run over him. <laughs> <laughs> the day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. So you go to Darlington in the spring of 88. What was that weekend like for you? We tested down there, too. I, Darlington had been some... You, you check the stats out and see where I finished in 1980 at Darlington, both races. Okay. That'll give you an idea how Darlington and I get along. <laughs> it's a rookie, 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 never don't know driver, don't know chassis, nothing. I think I finished seventh one race and eighth the other. Every time I went to Darlington, I've after that first couple of years when we were after we got in Hoss's car, mm -hmm. like I win the race every time I went there. Yeah. It didn't matter yeah. what it was in. I just had a knack for that place. It was didn't always qualify that good, but come to the end of the race, watch me. See what would be happening. And it was just a great place for me. I don't I always loved that track. Well, what do you remember about the race itself as it panned out? Dale Earnhardt asked me how long is it going to take you before you lap me before the race started? <laughs> wow. Okay. That's so impressive. Know. We'll have to see. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what it was, but I did lap him. Yeah, yeah. What was Everybody it? Everybody else except Alan. Alan was the only one I hadn't lapped. What was it like to cross under the checkered flag? Relief. Yeah. It was like, God dang, finally. Yeah. Had a race and nothing happened, you know bad you know but it had the dominant car in practice had dominant car all race so it wasn't it wasn't gonna be a problem it just didn't have any trouble now the next week did you get to do anything to kind of enjoy the moment or were you pretty much having to focus on getting to bristol the next week just a regular race another race i'm gonna okay. tell you it was an interesting thing happened when reese and i were driving away from darlington that night Driving back home, I looked over at her and I said, Race, are you feeling any different than you did when we drove down here this morning? She said, What do you mean? I said, We're going home, same house, same everything. There's another race next weekend. Is anything really different? Yeah. I said, I don't guess it is, is there? <laughs> Just another race. Lake, you and I were talking before we started to re record, and you said that your part in helping to create or form Motor Racing Outreach was probably your biggest accomplishment. What? How did all that play out? How did that happen? Uh, I made God got a hold of me and turned my life around August twenty eighth, nineteen eighty three, and. Prior to that, I thought I was a Christian, but God showed me I wasn't and asked me if I want to let. <laughs> Specifically, he spoke to me and said, why don't you let me drive for a while? <laughs> You've been driving your little red wagon and yeah. running off in a ditch yeah. a yeah. bunch and bruised it up and yeah. skinned it up and whatever. Why don't you let me drive your life for a little while? And I said, yes, sir, I'm ready, more than ready. And from that time point, from that point forward, you know, I was in God's Word a lot and would be in church and trying to learn. And uh, I, was, I was a rookie. I was a rookie Christian. And I wanted to be all that God wanted me to be. And so that meant I needed to spend time not only in His Word, but with His people, you know, and congregation. And so we were on a limited schedule at that time when it happened. So I was in my church, local church, when we weren't racing. I was in church every week. And when I was racing, I said, you know, we had a chaplain that came around, did a little little service, but it was really small, wasn't much to it. And uh, 
after a few years of that, uh, Stevie and Daryl, Stevie and Daryl, and uh, my wife and uh, Bobby Hillen and his wife and later Phil Parson and his wife, we were all thinking, you know, what a church is the people; it's not the building. Yeah, and. Yeah. Why can't we have a church service and have a church here at the racetrack? If we could have this little 10 or 15 minute thing, we could do something longer, bigger, if, if somebody would would do it. And so we started praying and asking God to send somebody that wanted to be a pastor to this group. And Max showed up in 1988 came from California, brought his family, and said it felt like God was telling him that, to come here and do this. And uh, so that was the beginning of motor racing outreach, just like that. Just a bunch of families, Christian families in racing, praying and asking God to do it. Now, after you ran your, you ran your team, 87, 88, 89, 90. 91, you go to drive for Kale. Yep. Uh, you ran your own team in 92 and 93. And then in 93, you hop in the 28 car after Davey, yep. after Davey's accident. How hard was that situation to step into that car? It was as easy as it could be. You had to back up just a little bit. People don't notice this. But I'd run General Motors products all through my career, and uh, and uh, what was that? What was the years? The first year there was talking eighty seven, eighty eight, ninety. At the end of ninety one, uh, finished ninety one. Getting ready for the Daytona 500. We were thinking about trying to go to race in uh, 92, and we didn't have any sponsorship lined up, nothing going on. And at the last minute, a guy drove up the driveway and said, uh, you know, you want to put a car together and go to Daytona? I think i got some sponsorship to work out for you. It was a Purex deal. Okay. Just a one-race yeah. yeah. one deal. And... Uh, we had a Chevrolet. I don't know how that thing came in the picture, but somehow or another we had a Chevrolet. And then we went to Daytona with that thing. And we didn't make the race. So we had to come back and looking like, uh, I think we went to one more race. And that was it for that year. Then the sponsorship deal he worked out with Nation, I mean, with uh, Purex for the next year was the first 10 races. So now we've kind of geared up. Mm -hmm. And in the process, my uh, <laughs> God sent me an engine builder that was, we'd had to close the shop. We'd, had, we'd let everybody go if there wasn't nobody but here, but just me guy calls me up and says, I'm building some motors for people um, and I need a dyno to run. I understand you have a dyno. I said, yeah. He said, well, can I rent it from you or something? I said, sure. You can come over and do something. Anyway, I met John Callis. John had been one of the, so one of the top people in the uh, Blue Max race team, all that stuff for Rusty all the years. And uh, they had had a falling out somehow or another. Anyway, he got booted out the door. He came here. And uh, so we got this 10 race thing coming up, and he's built a couple motors and run them on the dyno and whatever. Got to know John a little bit. And I told him that, I asked him, I said, well, I need to see if we can't get some motors built here for this 10 race deal. And he said, well, have you thought about Fords? 
I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you can't even buy the castings of the cylinder heads that are the current Chevrolet heads. They won't even sell them to you. Only the top teams get them. Mm-hmm. He said, to, f- to try to make some like it will cost you $10,000 for a set of heads. He said, but I can buy Ford heads for $2,400 that'll make 700 horsepower without me touching them. <laughs> well, let me he think said, about if that. You, if you considered running a Ford, and I said, yeah. I just did. Fact, Sign me up. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. And uh, so I said, well, I guess we need buy the motors. And he said, yeah. He said, they probably the the easiest and quickest thing to do is buy the used motor from somebody, and then I can go through it, update it, and whatever. So I called Robert. I said, Robert, uh, you're the one that's making these new trick heads and whatever. Yeah. You got any used motors, a good used motor I can buy, and, uh, you know, I'm going to switch over to Ford. I can't afford to run General Motors stuff. cost too much. He said, sure. He said, I'd be glad to. I said, I they made me a deal on the motor and bought the motor. And I said, well, one part of this deal is uh, you got to help me, teach me how to do all the plumbing work on the car and get it all, you know, changed over. Motor mounts are different. All the oil system's different. Everything's different. He said, no problem, no problem. He said, the guys in the shop back here, I'll tell them these. They'll show you exactly what you need to do on everything. So we bought the motor, and John went through the motor and rebuilt it. And, and uh we uh, no, we didn't rebuild it the first time we ran it. We uh, uh, changed everything on the car. So we, I'd spent time in his shop working with his guys, showing him, explaining me how to do all this stuff. And we came back and overhauled ours and got it all running the Ford. And we go to track and run it. And runs pretty good and run, run pretty decent. And then John went through it and uh, souped it up, sure enough. And uh, we go, we show up at Charlotte. And uh, we're out there running. We're running fast. <laughs> Robert and, and his his son come down and said, "That the motor we sold?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Yeah." He said, "I ain't supposed to run that fast because <laughs> I was faster than they were." Uh oh. Yeah, in practice. <laughs> Did they try to repossess you? No, 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 no. They were real curious about it. Yeah. John got a phone call the next week after the 600. They went hiring. Wow. He said, no, stay on the lake. Did he really? Yep. Wow. Um, One of the most memorable moments I had was that weekend. That car and the motor was so fast. Okay. I don't know. Higgins wrote me up in the in the Sunday morning paper. Said, wow. "Watch this guy." Wow. Because he has been the fastest consistently through all the. Now, practice. what track was it? Charlotte. Charlotte. Okay. Charlotte. And uh, we, uh, they, <laughs> it was crazy. It was crazy. We, it was. I'd never had the car that much faster than everybody else anywhere, and uh, we had qualified. You know, they, they, what they did to qualifying back then was they started qualifying in the sun, and then yeah. the last yeah. qualifiers yeah. were in the shade. Yeah. I was one of the first ones out yeah. and in the sun, so I didn't qualify great. But by the first, I think I started to qualify 15 something. By the first uh, pit stop, I was second. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> they dropped the jack, and I dropped the clutch. Yeah. And it snapped off the ring gear and pinion off the front of the thing. Hmm. The guys push the car back. I'm heartbroken. They push it in the garage. They said, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. we got to get the car out from TV and the sponsorship, you know, all this stuff. They put another gear. didn't have the right gear. Put the wrong gear in it. We'll be back out. And we went out. It was just after another caution pit stop. And they had, I guess, I went out, and then they'd come around here, and they'd come around and start the race. They restart, and Earnhardt and Davey were running first and second. And... uh you guys were telling me, they heard on the radio, on the radio, this, that uh, Davey had told them, said, 
told NASCAR, said, you need to get Lake out of the way so he won't be holding us up. And NASCAR called him back and said, if you catch him, we'll, let you, we'll get him out of the way. <laughs> I drove away. <laughs> Never saw him if you catch him, <laughs> yeah, if, you catch him if you catch him, we'll move him. They never, never had to. Wow, crazy fast, but we we're about fifty laps down or something. Yeah. <laughs> now, is that, that was the coolest? That was going to be the best race. Is that kind of what established the relationship with Robert yeah. to get into the twenty eight? Yeah. Now, you did the I think three or four races in the twenty eight car three. after Davy after Davy's accident. Did that kind of open the door to get the ride with Bud Moore oh, yeah. for the 94 season? Yeah. There's okay. another really cool story. You're like this, too. Now. So, <laughs> so uh, the deal happened. You know, we finished our 10-race deal with those guys. The last race was at Talladega. Mm -hmm. It was a Talladega race. And yeah. David just gotten killed. Right. You know, a couple of weeks before that. And so I'm sitting on the pit wall down there getting ready to go out qualify and everything. And uh, – Thinking, well, this is our last race. We're here. We're done again, you know. And uh, Robert walks up and sits down on the wall beside me. He says, uh, "Got a question for you." He said, "Would you be interested in driving my car?" He said, "I don't know if it'd be one race, few races." Are all the races the rest of the year? He said we're in the NASC, I said, uh, Texaco, whatever is in negotiations with another driver right now, uh, but he's under contract with somebody else. Oh, to get in the twenty eight. Okay, put, yeah, put in the twenty eight. Right. He said, but don't know whether that's going to happen or not. But uh, would you be willing to? Do it? I said, well, it. Tell you the truth, this is the last race I got with my sponsorship. I don't have anything else anyway, so I'm yeah, I'm available. I'm ready. Be, that'd be awesome. So uh, he calls me back uh, Monday after the race and says, "You still still good for that?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, we're probably not going to put you in the car this weekend. We're going to see if we can't get us a road race, one of these road yeah. race ringers right. to put in yeah. the car yeah. to run it and everything." And I said, "Robert." <laughs> you, you don't know that I'm a world champion road racer? He said, what? Huh? I said, <laughs> I got 20 years of road racing experience in the karts. I'm a 1978 world champion kart racing. Yeah. He said, let me call you back. <laughs> so I don't know who they had to yeah. talk yeah. to. Yeah. They yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't talk to somebody. And they just called me back up and said, we decided we're gonna give you a chance. Holy cow. Give you a try. Yeah. Let's go up there. So yeah. it's awesome I go down fit get fitted for the car and everything, you know, and then we go to the races and practice comes around and he he said, You hadn't raced here in a while, have you? And I said, No, it's it's been a few years since uh he said, They put this bus stop thing in the back straightaway back there. He said, I think the last time you raced you just went straight all the way down the straightaway. I said, Yeah, that's right. He said, well, just be careful of that thing. You know, just be easy. And if you if you get in over your head, you can go straight through it. You know, that's so, you know, whatever. He said, but just be careful and go out there and run. You don't have to try to set on records or anything. There's no pressure. Just take it easy and go around and run. So I went out and practiced and taking it easy, running, running, everything, and come in. And he goes down and went and he said, did you go through that bus stop or did you go straight through? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I went through the bus stop. <laughs> he said, man, I, could, I think he said, I think it was like 17th fastest first time out. I said, well, that's probably about right. I, I'm not running hard yet. I'm just taking it easy. I'm doing what you told me to do. I'm just going around taking it easy. Okay, you know. So we we practiced some more and got going better and better and uh, came time qualifying I qualified fourth and uh, he said, "Dang, we ain't never qualified in the top ten, yeah, ever." I said, "You ain't seen it all yet, buddy." <laughs> I'm all right still, then. I'm still take, I, I still take. I was taking it cautiously then. Yeah, too. yeah. 
they dropped the green flag, and I went to second just like that and was running Mark down, and the transmission broke. Hmm. Wow. And when I got out of the car came back, they said, need you up in front of the trailer. All the Ford people in there. And they said, we don't want you out of a Ford. Wow. If we just we're gonna we're gonna work on something. Yeah. I said, Great. I went the next weekend to Michigan, qualified outside pole and uh led a bunch of the race and I don't remember where we finished, I think third or something like that. And uh, then the next weekend we went to Bristol. Thought we had a shot at the pole and uh Slip, I slip a little bit, and uh, and got wrecked in the race. And the next week was off week. We went to Darlington to test. <laughs> Larry Mack and all yeah, those guys yeah. had a grin on their face as big as because they'd seen me wear them out down yeah. there a bunch of times. Said, this is going to be big. Yeah. And uh, we went down there and tested real good. Every time I see Larry, he said, "Man, I sure wish." Been one more week. <laughs> I wish we could have seen you in that yeah. car, but yeah. it, it, you know, down at Darlington. I said, well, but Ernie got out of his deal and uh, got put in that car. And Ford guys called and said, "We got something else for you." And that was when Jeff was wanting to buy Allen's deal. Allen's deal. Yeah. And so me being available, they were willing to say, "Okay, go." I said, "You go, and we're gonna put Lake in Bud's car." Yeah, you go do do your own deal, and so that's how that happened. Bud was pretty much the definition of old school World War II veteran, D Day veteran. What was your time like with him? He was great and vigil, but was falling behind. Yeah, yeah. You know, they they weren't on top of things. Uh, the technology and some of the stuff that was going on in the cars, the body way, the body, the aero stuff was not there. And they were doing their own engine work stuff, too. And uh, Old school and hard-headed. And I, I I had John, my guy who was doing my engines, try to help him with the motors, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to him. And, mm, uh, yeah. So I beat my head against that wall. Until I couldn't stand it anymore. I, just, yeah. I, was, I got frustrated. Yeah. I was just frustrated. That... So you wind up going over to Harry Melling in the nine car. Yeah. And that had been one of the sportiest rides in the garage not that long before. How had things changed, if any, when you went over there? Well... Melling racing when it was in Georgia and the Elliots were running it. Mm-hmm. It was highly successful. Gotcha. When they split mm-hmm. and they moved it to North Carolina, and they took his stuff and came to North Carolina and built cars. He had uh, steel forwards, but all their own stuff. Uh, they had missed something like 14 races out of 18 yeah. or something that had been run that year. They just they were just way out of the ballpark. And Harry called me and said, "Help! <laughs> yeah, I need somebody that can not only drive it but can run the team and manage the team. Yeah, in those." what they're doing. He yeah. said, I need you to help me big time. Hmm. And uh, he said, I've got some money I put into the deal, plus I think we've got a, a mainline sponsor that's going to come on and, and you know, you'll have a, have a decent budget, you know, a $3 million budget, something like that. Everybody else is 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I didn't have anything. When I quit Buds, I, I just, it was, I just, if I didn't have anything, that was, I didn't have, I hadn't worked out the deal with Harry before that. I'd already told him I was not coming back. You know, yeah. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. 
So I went over there and uh, tried to reorganize everything and get everything going. We never missed a race. And had some really close ones to winning some with it, too. Okay. <laughs> you probably know what I'm going to ask next, but 1995, Michigan, uh, <laughs> you you and Michael Waltrip oh, yeah. okay. on pit road after the race. Yeah. How in the world is anybody going to – Treat you like that. You're Lake Speed. You're the you're you're the founder of Motor Racing Outreach. You're the one of the nicest people I've ever met. Period. Much less in NASCAR, and that happens. What what actually transpired on the track? Well, first of all, you got to remember this is Mellon's home track. Okay. If it's possible to put any more emphasis into a race than you do any other race, it's absolutely going to happen there. The driver's going to be try harder. Yeah. You're going to do everything to the max. Okay, we had a pretty good run that day. We were – that we'd been running well. Uh, at the last pit stop, I think we had a boo-boo in a pit stop, so I didn't come back out fifth or wherever I was been running, fourth, fifth, something like that. And uh, so I'm coming back up through the field. I'm passing cars, getting getting back up there. And when I got to Michael, he started blocking me. And I put up with that for about one lap. And then the next lap, I went down, drove down underneath him and kind of just eased him up into the marbles and then went on. Did you really? Yeah. All right, Lake. I, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. I okay. Had to go. All right. Yeah, all right. You know, and. Yeah. Uh, when somebody's blocking you flagrantly, uh, you know, I feel like that's anything goes in. I mean, whatever you want to do. I didn't hit him in the bumper, spin yeah. him out or anything. Yeah. I just moved him out of the way and uh, went on. Never thought of been thinking. Nothing. It wasn't even on my mind. I'm thinking, man, Tad Gum, I had a really good run. I was fixing to have a super good finish and at least a – all the melon customers saw the race and then, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're running hard and have a good day and everything. And about that time, he comes up and does this police move on me. I'm thinking, what the heck is going on here, you know? And then comes out and does what he's doing. And I back up, and he's walking down the, down the thing there. Satan says, run over him. <laughs> <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, Don't you dare. <laughs> so I just I'm going to run on by in the garage. <laughs> but I just tell it like it is. <laughs> what happened. Now, was that. Michael so and I had, had some issues yeah. over the years. Okay. There was a few times that uh, he thought I could. I forgot what it was. It had a race at Pocono or something. He swore him down that I wrecked him out there on purpose or something, you know, and it was, I didn't, you know, yeah. but it was kind of like he carried a grudge after that. He stuffed me in a wall at Martinsville one day when I was passing him. Martinsville. But it just stuff happens. Now, is that something that you and he t eventually talked about? Oh, yeah, we talked about it. Okay. And, you know, I, I don't care grudges them. I forgive people, and God's real clear about that. If you, if you can't forgive people, maybe God won't forgive you. <laughs> you know? Nineteen ninety eight starts, and the results aren't great. And then you go to Sears Point, and you break your sternum during practice, and you miss the race, yeah. and you come back at New Hampshire, uh, but you wind up leaving the team afterward. Was that? Your call was that kind of a mutual parting, or it was my call? Okay, my call. You need to know the whole story about that thing. I'm trying to decide if I want to tell all the story. Probably better not. Uh, that was the year we changed over to Taurus it's from the T Birds, and this little low budget team got jump start on everybody, and. Uh, we built the first car, and we're testing the first car, I think, maybe October, November. And we learned a bunch. We went to Daytona, rented a track by ourselves, went down there and did our homework, came back and built another car. And, yeah. Uh, 
We went to the official Ford test at Talladega, second lap faster than everybody. Hmm. We had high expectations for the season. Went to Daytona, I guess, the, the race the weekend before, whatever it is, finished second in that. And uh, didn't have a great race in the 500. I don't remember too much about it. I don't remember. I don't even remember where I finished. Well, you and John Andretti, I believe, brought out the last caution that yeah. Earnhardt raced back Probably. around. Seems like okay. the last yeah. several races, restrictor yeah. plate races, yeah. I got wound up getting wrecked on the yeah. last lap yeah. or something. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise me. But uh, uh, we went, we struggled some of the races that year. And, but it, it's not like we were bad. We were still good, but just weren't, you know, pit stops and motor break or whatever, it's just stuff happens, you know, and sometimes you just get where it's just bad luck. You just stuff gets you on it. But we built a really good road race car and went to Sonoma and unloaded. I was top of the chart. I stayed at the top of the chart to mm -hmm. most of all, I think all of practice. I think I was the fastest one there through all of practice until they start doing their simulated qualifying runs. And then when the uh, simulated qualifying runs were going, Okay, we're gonna go out and do ours. When I came off that back turn back there in the back, and you start down through the S's, there was a bunch of gravel and stuff out on the racetrack. Mm. I didn't think too much about it. I was, I'm fixing to lay these people down on a killer lap. I'm fixing this. This is gonna be good. <laughs> and so I sailed down in that turn ten, wide open. Gonna we'll make that right hand turn. And I turned the steering wheel, and it didn't turn any. Straight in the uh, barrier. Yeah, yeah. Through that gravel, I'd cut cut the left front tire down, and uh, so I hit that fence. And the first time I can remember, first time, one time I ever remember in the car when, when they told me, you know, on the radio, Are "You okay?" And I couldn't hardly talk, mm. breathe. I said, "No." <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that was it. Was a took me to the infield care center. They they uh, check you over, guys. I said, my ribs hurt really bad. Yeah. Can you? I mean, are they broken? He said, there's no way for us to know without you getting an X-ray. He said, I I don't know whether you're broken or not. So he said, but if you want to get checked out, you can go to the hospital, and they'll X-ray you and find out. I said, yes, I'm, I want to. And guys want me to get in the car, backup car, and start this race tomorrow. And that, but I remember Jeff Bodine crashing in practice at Charlotte one day out there, and he punctured a lung mm -hmm. and went home. Yeah. Could have died and yeah. done the darn thing. So I said, I, I want to go get x-rays. So we went to the hospital, got the x-rays. I asked the and I said, well, what's the deal? I got broken ribs or what? And they said, we don't tell you that. You'll have to talk to the doctor. We'll give the report back to the doctor at the track, and they'll tell you. So I went back to the track and went to the doctor, and he said, well, they checked you out and said, you don't have any broken ribs. You're okay. It's okay. So I went over. That was the time when we had that trailer going around, and with all these uh, therapists, physical therapist yeah, yeah, guys who were yeah, doing everything, yeah. so I went over there. Man, those guys put electric tinge units all over me and <laughs> wrapped me up with yeah. all kinds of stuff and anti-inflammatories and just fixed me all up, you know. And I was still hurting a lot, you know, but it, it was manageable. And the guys got the backup car out and I said, well, this was next day, and I said, well, go out and make a lap and see, you know, just see see if you're going to be okay. And they had another kid lined up to drive it. You know, I knew I couldn't drive it, race it. I went around, and I couldn't hardly make a lap around. It felt mm. like somebody sticking yeah. ice picks in yeah. my chest. Yeah. I got in, I told guys, there ain't no way, no way. And I said, all right, all right, well, just take it easy and go home do it. Well, next weekend was supposed to be 4th of July firecracker we were going there it, that's the one of those fires postponed yeah 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 so went drove down there and went through all that and came back home my next weekend was new hampshire in the meantime 
still hurting a lot and all this stuff. I got to thinking about Jeff Bodine, and I said, Jeff had built a seat that held you in just by your shoulders and nothing on your ribs. I borrowed that seat, and we put it in my car, and I ran the race up there. You know, when you did a plug check and cut the motor off and had to coast in and the power steering doesn't work, it drives really hard. Ooh. All I oh, gosh. do yeah. to get in the oh, garage my goodness. area with, yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, you know, you just you hurt, but it, you, know, you just tough it out and go. So I ran the whole race. All right. The next, was it next day or two days later, we were in Indianapolis testing had two other cars at Indy testing. They don't have that seat. Now I'm pushing yeah. against the ribs. Yeah. And I uh, ran the first day and you know, just running. Luckily, that track's really smooth and the corners are long, so it's, you know, it's not really getting on you too much. I got to thinking to myself, wait a minute, something ain't saying right. You know, you tighten the seat belts up, and when you do, you hear this. Like your knuckles crack, cracking or something. You know what I'm saying? Oh wow! I'm thinking, huh? These guys tell me there ain't nothing wrong with me, but my brain's telling me <laughs> if I hit the fence, yeah. yeah, if we were to blow a tire out or something here, yeah, it'd be ugly. And so that night, I didn't take any inflammatories and none of that stuff. I said I'm gonna just see what I really feel like. And so I went to the track and I toughed it through that next day. And I said, no, my hmm. brain won't let me do this. Yeah. And, and I, I told them, I said, you're going to have to get somebody else in the car. And they're telling me there's nothing broken, but my brain won't let me do this. You have to get somebody else. And I, it was over a month later that I was still hurting. And I got a, uh insurance statement for a workman's compensation. <laughs> Yeah. Policy, you know, one of those things. If you get injured, yeah, whatever. I thought, I'm gonna call these people and see if they if they're gonna do something. And they said, well, you got to go get a doctor's letter, whatever. So I went to uh, a clinic there in Charlotte, which is now Ortho Carolina. It used to be something else. I forgot to call it. Anyway, guy had worked on me before when I broke my shoulder and different things, and he said, well, it's I got to examine you to make this good. And he took his thumb and he pushed on my sternum. And I almost left the room. Oh. And he said, how long ago has this been? I said, well, it was over a month. And he said, go in there and we're going to get some x-rays. I said, well, they already took x-rays. He says, nothing broken. Said, go in there. Took the x-rays. He comes back in a little bit. Briar eating, mule eating Briar's grin on his face. <laughs> No broken ribs, huh? Look at this. He put it up on there, and it looked like four broken broomsticks. He said, and if you look close here, you see the sternum's cracked in two places, too. Wow. He said, I don't see people broken up like this in streetcar wrecks. Yeah. He said, no wonder. Yeah. He said, I said, well, how long will it be before I can get back in the car or do anything? He said, at least six months more. Yes. Done. And that's what that's that's what the end of it. Really? I'd already resigned and then I there was a few people called but it, yeah. nobody really had anything that yeah would be competitive and I was, I'm fifty years old. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Lake, you got three kids that are teenagers. They need you a whole lot more than NASCAR does. You are somebody. You're my daddy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What was your transition out of the sport like? Was it difficult to not be going to the racetrack every week? Was, you know, were you maybe? Yeah. Okay. It was hard. Uh, not going to the racetrack probably wasn't as hard as uh, not going to the shop. Okay. Not being involved in building the cars and trying yeah. to make a better better mousetrap. Yeah. I enjoyed that as much as I did the racing, which I loved the racing. Don't get me wrong. I really like figuring out 
stuff to yeah. because I mean when you don't have the money you got to figure out some stuff to be able to be competitive. <laughs> you, you can't be competitive with somebody if you don't have the bucks. Now you did wind up racing the historic racing stuff at Daytona. You won some races down there. You mentioned earlier that you had won the uh, national karting championship. Was that enough to scratch your itch competitively? Pretty much, pretty much yeah. Okay. Uh, not completely, though. Yeah. You know, the, the road race thing with the carts, 08, uh, next year is really when the economy took a dive. And I went to went to a couple of races the next year, and it just there wasn't hardly anybody showing up. There anybody to race. I don't care about just riding around, you know. I said, forget this. And the reason I'd gone to the road race in the first place, there wasn't any sprint racing, sprint-type racing in the Carolinas or anywhere close by. Uh, and then, lo and behold, they built GoPro Motor Complex out here. And I went, whoa. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. Because <laughs> with the vintage stuff, I'd yeah. gotten into the vintage stuff uh -huh. pretty early on, I think like 2000 three or something like that when I found the vintage carts and yeah. started playing with them. But uh, that's that's not s serious hard racing. That's just okay. you know, have fun with yeah. old stuff yeah. and yeah. have fun with guys that you hadn't seen in a long time, like a old high school reunion or something, practically. Yeah. But then when they built this thing out here, I said, okay, got a bunch of kids running out here. Mostly, Most of them are in their teens and a few of them in their 20s, and most of them, that's about all there is. And a few people older, but they had an older division, but I'm so little. The older division, I had put 80 pounds of lead on the cart to make weight. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go cart with 80 pounds of lead on, on top of me. <laughs> so, yeah. so I just said, so oh, shit, I'm going to race with the kids. And so I've been doing that for several years now. I just go when I want to, go play. It's fun. Good deal. Good so that deal. takes care of my itch. 